Hello, I'm Linda Darling Hammond. I am president of the Learning Policy Institute, and I'm here to talk to you about some of the work we have recently been doing around principal preparation and its effects on student learning and equity. Among other things, we know the brain is always developing uh, as a function of relationships and experiences, and what those are matters greatly for both the development of the brain and intelligence and for learning itself. Uh, that's what schools are all about, and so we need people who understand what it is that will support learning and development. We also know that learning is social, emotional, and academic, that they are completely interconnected, that uh, if you feel positively in a learning experience, if you trust the teacher and your uh, peer students, if you uh, feel competent and capable, you will learn more. If you come to that experience with uh, trauma, with stigma, with uh, a negative uh, set of emotions, um, with fear, you will learn less. So that has great implications for the learning environment. Children actively construct knowledge by connecting what they know to what they're learning, and they always do that within their cultural contexts. So being able to make connections to their prior knowledge, experiences, and cultural context matters greatly. Students' perceptions of their own ability influence learning. So the way in which schools either uh, support and affirm students or label and sort and select students can matter for how much individual students learn. We also know that trauma and adversity affect learning that's been especially uh, pronounced in the pandemic years. Uh, the ways in which we process uh, adverse conditions uh, affects the brain architecture and uh, attention for learning. We also know that relationships and belonging are the most effective antidote to trauma. And all of these things are things uh, that define the kind of schools that we create. Uh, what kind of schools we need are less likely to resemble the schools of the past, each individual student sitting in their own desks, filling out their own worksheets, and much more like a school in which students are working collaboratively together, inquiring into uh, the way things are supported by uh, the teacher uh, in a way that is uh, exciting and engaging, as well as um, free of um, trauma and stress. Uh, kids bring that into school, but also schools sometimes create a lot of stress for students. So we need to be developing, if we want learning to flourish, schools which produce much less cortisol, the hormone that floods the body, creates the fight or flight syndrome, clouds the brain, shuts down learning, and schools that produce much more oxytocin, what I think of as the hugging hormone, which is the way in which uh, we learn best when we feel trusting and trusted and secure. Uh, we've been working uh, th with the uh, Ed Prep Lab and other uh, organizations in the United States to develop uh, design principles for schools and for the preparation of educators uh, that really express what's needed in a school environment for learning to be uh, most uh, at, at its greatest um, leverage. And that includes positive developmental relationships. It includes environments that are structured for belonging and, and for purpose. It includes knowledge uh, work and deeper learning that is engaged in inquiry, which is the way human brains learn best. Uh, it includes explicit attention to social and emotional skills and habits and mindsets, including a growth mindset, and it includes those student supports that remove barriers or obstacles to learning. All of these things are things that school principals need to be aware of and also know how to develop. So when we think about what uh, the science is telling us, the three R's for thriving schools, uh, of course, still include reading, writing, and arithmetic, but they also are relationship-centered, uh, they're restorative in the way in which students are enabled to connect to the community rather than being excluded if there are challenges uh, that occur and that are responsive to children's needs and assets, to their 
cultural knowledge, funds of knowledge and the ways of learning, uh, and to their academic, social and emotional needs. So when we think about all of that in the context of our research on principal learning, uh, we can see the connections between where schools need to go and what principals need to learn to support equity and to support strong learning for all students. We uh, at LPI have just completed a set of studies uh, that looked at uh, high quality principal learning, both in pre-service preparation and professional development, uh, both in light of the practices and policies that are underway in uh, the field in the United States, current research on principal development, and these advances in the science of learning and development uh, to figure out what principals benefit from and how they get access to that kind of learning. We reviewed research uh, on the influences of principal professional development, both on principals' own perceptions and behaviors and actions, on teacher perceptions, practices, and retention, and on student and school outcomes. Uh, we did original analyses of principal learning, which I'm going to say a word about, and then surveys of how principals got access to that learning and reviewed the research and documentation. And when we think about the equity considerations in this field, uh, we're talking both about the labor market, who gets to be a principal, who is supported on the pathway to becoming a principal, does that reflect uh, the demographics of the student population, uh, is it equitable by gender as well as by a demographic background. Uh, it of course has to do with the program itself. What do principals learn about how to support equitable learning? And then of course uh, the school, what uh, kinds of schools get access to what kind of principals with what kind of learning. We think about principal learning both with respect to the how of learning and the what of learning. And from the um, literature that uh, we studied, it's clear that certain things uh, matter for principals to learn. Things about leading instruction, about shaping the positive school climate, about developing people and professional learning for staff uh, and uh, teachers and others. Uh, me meeting the needs of diverse learners has become more important as we have expectations for all students to achieve at high levels. And of course, managing change because we are in a period of extensive change in education, which has been uh, even more accelerated by the pandemic. The how also matters. Do people have an opportunity to apply their learning to real life circumstances and situations rather than just learning theory? Uh, do they have internships where they get to learn under the wing of an expert principal who can demonstrate, model, and coach uh, along the way? That turns out to be extremely important. And uh, what kind of frequency do they have of professional learning opportunities? Both things like mentoring and coaching, uh, workshops and conferences, uh, and also being part of a principal network where people can share their experiences and learn together. And in some, we found that comprehensive approaches to principal preparation and development do positively influence what principals do, what teachers do, and how they feel about staying in the school, and what students do and how they achieve. And particularly important, as I signaled, is whether there are these opportunities for internships and problem-based learning, mentoring and coaching, learning about uh, those key features of instructional leadership and developing uh, people and serving, um, meeting the needs of diverse learners. So uh, the relationship between principal preparation uh, and teacher retention is very strong. We found that every feature of principal preparation that we were measuring, as well as uh, an overall variable that we used to kind of um, tally up all of those experiences, were strongly related to whether teachers would stay in a school. Uh, the better prepared principals were able to uh, keep teachers in their schools at higher rates. Um, one example is a poorly prepared teacher uh, principal who had sort of a score of two on the 10 point preparation quality scale uh, would um, see on average about 78% of their teachers stay in the next year in the data set that we could look at in California as compared to 89% uh, 
uh, teacher retention in a school with a very well prepared principal. Obviously, the things they've learned how to do uh, support teachers in doing their work. We also see student gains. Uh, we saw them in both math and English language arts uh, for principals uh, with different levels of professional development access. And in general, uh, professional development uh, was very strongly related to student achievement in both English language arts and mathematics. And you can see that um, the early career principals uh, the students who were in schools of early career principals who had a lot of professional development gained a lot more um, and that that really enabled those new principals to become almost comparable to the effectiveness of principals with much more experience. We also found that those student gains, this happens to be in mathematics, uh, were much larger for historically underserved student populations uh, when their principals had had access to professional learning, in this case in particular around instructional leadership. Uh, but all of those features turned out to matter. But we also found that very few principals have had access to the kinds of comprehensive programs that support their success and relatively few experience the most powerful kinds of learning, uh, including those kinds of internships where they got a chance to study under the wing of an expert principal and try on the administrative tasks with that support and coaching and help. Uh, very few had access to peer observation and coaching. We found that professional learning is highly variable across uh, the United States. I suspect that is also true in Brazil. Uh, and we also found that policy was variable across the states. And while some were really making progress towards equitably available, strong opportunities for principal learning, others were making much less progress. Uh, among the things that are important is the use of high leverage policies, both for approving the programs that prepare principals uh, and uh, in licensing principals uh, to be able to um, enter the workforce. So we found that um, from uh, one of the studies that was a foundation for a policy scan, that there are some of these approaches that are very high leverage. They're supported by research. They do produce stronger principal practice and outcomes. And those include proactively recruiting candidates into the principalship, not just waiting to see who shows up, but identifying dynamic uh, expert teachers. Maybe they've been mentors and coaches themselves, pulling them into preparation programs so that they could build on that skill level and knowledge base in going into a leadership role. Uh, the use of school leadership standards that articulate what school leaders are expected to know and be able to do uh, so that the programs can organize around them. Uh, induction and professional development and evaluation can also be organized around those standards. Uh, those clinically rich internships that I've already talked about and very strong relationships between universities and districts so that together they are selecting and supporting and preparing uh, the principals who will go into practice already knowing how to practice in that district. Uh, we also see that things like uh, a certain level of experience and education uh, translate into more effectiveness. Uh, assessment is very important, including what we call uh, portfolio assessments where um, programs, in the case of California, the entire state, uh, ask principals to demonstrate uh, that they can effectively evaluate and support teacher learning, that they can uh, effectively uh, look at a situation in a school and make a plan for school improvement, that they can effectively set up uh, the kinds of professional development that are needed to move a school forward. Uh, and we actually look at that in practice, we measure it, and it's part of the decision to give the license. And then having a way by which to renew the license, principals get ongoing professional uh, opportunities, uh, which then, of course, means that they're more likely to continue to grow and learn together. So we know that access to professional learning matters for principal success and retention and that of the teachers and students in their schools. We know that that matters greatly for equity uh, in uh, opportunity for children. 
Uh, and then the big question that we tackle is how will we provide more opportunity for principals uh, to learn and create the policies that make that widely possible. I know you are taking up these questions uh, and you'll have the opportunity to hear from my wonderful colleague Marjorie Wexler uh, and I look forward to the ongoing conversation that will result.